Welcome to the Carnivore Cast, the podcast focused on the carnivore diet and lifestyle. With practical advice from successful carnivores, citizen scientists, and top researchers. I'm your host, Scott Maslinski, and I'm here to speak with experts and experienced carnivores to get answers to your biggest and meatiest questions while helping you live your best life as a carnivore. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore Cast on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast. Check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. Anya Fernholtz, CEO slash co-founder of Bell Campo, the largest regenerative farming operation in the United States, joins me today and believes it's regenerative farming is a better way to raise meat sustainably. She's also served as a judge on Iron Chef America between 2009 and 2011. Anya has been recognized for being a top 40 under 40 by Food & Wine. She's inspired, appeared in the New York's New Yorker's 2014 issue and has also co-authored two books, including a cookbook of her own. Anya has also founded the Food Craft Institute, a nonprofit that puts out an annual Eat Real Food Festival each year in Oakland. Welcome to the show, Anya. Thank you for having me. Of course. And we were just chatting briefly before the show about Bel Campo. Um, my wife and our, I and our family were able to check out the New York restaurant location pre-COVID um, and absolutely loved the food we had there. It was a whole experience seeing all the meat in the butcher rack, um, buying some on our way out, getting ready. And we were just very, very excited. It was like one of the most memorable meals we've had. Um, and just learning so much more about um, your company and some of the practices and education was was really special as well. So very excited to chat with you today. Cool. Likewise. Thanks. Um, so I'd, I'd love to start with a little bit more about your background and how you got involved in food generally, and maybe what your background was like before finding regenerative agriculture. Yeah, I mean, I've worked in, in agriculture my whole career, um, really since my early 20s, right after college, and I started out working in dairies. And I think my, my drive towards it, I, I love culinary, I love making food, but I was never particularly interested in just being a chef. Um, part of that's the kind of kitchen culture, which I think has gotten a lot of press lately, but it wasn't particularly appealing to me. But also, I, I just am intrigued by ingredients. And honestly, the best food that I've ever had is ingredient driven. You know, if I think about the memorable kind of meals and um, meals that give me a sense of vitality and health, it's, it's things that have a really special ingredient. And sometimes they're, they're just often, you know, the simplest meals. It's like an amazing piece of sheep cheese and like a little bit of something right, you know, in a special place, but a, a flavor of a place. So I was always really intrigued with the making of food um, and, and the farming side of it. So I, I, I started working as a cheesemaker right after college. I moved to Europe. I ended up staying over there for about seven years. And in that time, I effectively embraced like a keto diet. I, I started, you know, working in animal ag where people eat a lot of animal products. And so kind of at the same time, I had a pretty radical health transformation um, and decided to stay in that lane, right? And to continue to, to live that way. And the, the, the aspect of regenerative, again, it comes from taste. Uh, I love good food. I love food that tastes like food. I like cooking without a ton of seasonings. And I like ingredients that have great vitality and flavor. And I found that those things came from the most kind of traditional and regenerative style of agriculture. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, and yeah, it's amazing when you get a really good quality meat, how you can just so easily turn it into a fantastic meal with just a little bit of salt or even salt and pepper. It's, it's like people are always looking for the next great recipe, different way to season your steak, um, different cooking methods, different um, seasonings, but when you start with the right ingredients, it's, it's amazing um, how, how easy it can be. I couldn't agree with you more, Scott. And I think in the U.S., the, the, this, the thing of, listen, I love good barbecue. Who doesn't? I'm an, I'm an American. Like, I love those flavors, <laughs> right? But from my perspective, for everyday eating, the reliance that we have in the U.S. on, like, sauces, so many of them are canola and soy-based, right? 
Mm. And it's like, you're taking one of nature's perfect foods and putting a bunch of garbage on it. That's bad for your health and causes inflammation. And I think if people could just try spending up on a better quality of meat, they're going to find typically that they don't need the sugary, oily, soy-y sauce. Yes, absolutely. And that kind of like flipping that switch for people is power because you know, when you, it's like when you're on the, the sauce and listen, I, I, I use sauces in my cooking, but I tend to use more like lemon and parsley, which are great for your digestion. Whenever I see somebody with like a marinade that they're, you know, completely reliant on, oh, everything tastes better with this. I'm, I'm hold your guns. Let's try a simple, good quality piece of meat and let's do the very minimum to it. And, and nine out of 10 times, I'm going to get them on my team. Right, because when you're having to put all that stuff on your meat to, to make it palatable, you've got pretty, you know, pretty bad meat. It's the same thing I think about like my my body. I'll go through shape times in my life when I'm like, oh, I'm gonna buy all this clothing online and I spend too much money, and then it's like, Anya, if you just spent that time working out or taking doing self care or like meditating, like you know what I mean? It's like, how yeah. are you gonna spend your time and money? Are you going to make, you know, on on the outside uh, fancy or are you going to make when the inside is beautiful? And typically the latter wins, right? And so with meat cooking, I think in the U.S. we've gone down this road where, you know, our chicken is super bland and flabby and like chewy and and we just have lost track of like what good, what good can taste like and, and good can be amazing. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's a, that's a great point. And um, you mentioned your own health story and, and transformation. What was your health like maybe before finding a keto diet and, and what did it do for you? I'm a little bit curious about that. So in, you know, I was an athlete in college um, and I was also on and off a vegetarian and vegan for years. And you, just, you were a rower, correct? Sorry. I was, interrupt. yeah. Yeah, me too. I rode for eight years, oh, nice. including at school. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that was like a very um, big part of my life. And, and I cared about nutrition. I thought I was doing a decent job with nutrition, but I, it's sort of like the constant, the the stuff that plagued me that changed, it was, you know, I was in my early twenties. So it's like, you know, your, your, your baseline is pretty awesome, right? You know, it's, it's kind of hard to mess up in the way that I feel like now my forties, it's like, if you're off the rails, people go off the rails really hard, but in your twenties, it's like, unless you got a real big problem, it's, you can, you know, it's, your metabolism is working for you and things. And plus I was super athletic. So it wasn't weight per se. It was more just like a lot of little things like getting frequent UTIs, having very dry skin, um, having constant canker sores, um, having, you know, bloodshot eyes, although I wasn't a drinker, um, split ends, dandruff, like these little things that I think now in today's world, you might call like inflam- inflammation markers. Yeah. Um, you know, but that's what it was. I mean, it was like, the, it was, I felt like I was in great health. I, you know, I felt like I looked great, but then it was, you know, and also little things like having cavities and then going to Europe, starting to eat like five pounds of cheese a day. I'm not really exaggerating. And then <laughs> I go back to my dentist in America and they're like, oh, actually those three fillings that you said you, you, need, you needed to get next time you came in, you actually don't need to get them. We don't really know why. Yeah. Like, that was rad. And that was like, what is going on here? And I, I, I think that, you know, I, I don't have great teeth genetically of my dad's teeth, as he always tells me. And they're crooked. They were before I had braces. And I tend, I tend to have a lot of cavities I did throughout my adolescence. And I can't remember the last time I had a filling. It's been 20 years. And so it's like, as soon as I switched to that different diet, things that I thought were just part of my makeup, like, oh, you know, I've got split ends and I, I tend to get cavities. Like they're just gone. And so it was a really empowering thing as a young woman to, especially because I grew up in like the low fat nineties, you know, where everyone was pounding like boxes of like fat free Entenmann's brownies and then thinking they were healthy. I remember with my crew team, like we would do like fat free pasta, you know, binging yep. on like all these yep. carbs and stuff, right? So all that, that was the moment that I was in. Um, but you know, I didn't put a name to it until keto started to thrive right in, in the U S and I put it together like, Oh yeah, that's the same diet that I kind of do when I'm in my best health, you know? Um, um, so it was really about me just finding what worked for me. Now I'm a cook, right. And a food person by background and career, I'm not a health person, but other thing that I noticed in my world was like, 
you know, I did lots of food TV. I hung out with a lot of really famous chefs and saw that world on the inside. And it's like th these guys, their health is like a dumpster fire. You know, like you just see this rampant um, struggle with like in the culinary world. And that yeah. was just kind of a, a note. I mean, granted, there's, there's, you know, it's not even about like obesity. There's, there's different shapes of chefs all around the world. But what I noticed in, the, in my time in Europe is that food producers and cooks were just kind of like normal people. But then when I came to the U.S., it was like this sort of culture of like supreme overindulgence, people celebrating just like abysmal health. And so I, when I came back, I'm like, I don't really want to be part of the culinary world because I don't want to be that guy when I'm 50. Like, I don't want to be that guy at all. And I found I gravitated a lot more, even though I'm in the culinary space, to kind of like wellness and health. That was more interesting to me. Now, I'm never going to be a yogi. I'm never going to see my own abdominal muscles in my whole life. That's okay. I'm, I'm happy with that, you know, but I'm, I'm, I am interested in, in living my best life and living every day with wellness, right? So I also kind of found like culturally that the culinary culture in the US, I think celebrates the wrong things. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, and what uh, propelled you to move from, um, you know, being an Iron Chef judge and um, being a cook and writing cookbooks to um, launching your own regenerative farming operation and scaling it to, um, you know, the, the massive success, I, I guess most people would say that is Bel Campo today. Like, well, tell us some of the, like my own consumer need state. Yeah. So when I, you know, when I moved back in 2006, I bought my, I immediately struggled with the food back in the U S and the first thing I decided to change was my meat. So I bought a whole cow at the time I had a produce company, I started a produce company, like distribution, a little produce business that was working with organic farmers in the Central Valley and selling into um, hospitals. And so I had like a couple little trucks and I had a warehouse access and stuff. So I, I was able to, not I knew a lot of farmers. So I was able to buy a whole cow. And um, this was before this was a thing. It just was like me saying, oh my God, I'm, I need better meat and I couldn't find it. Um, and so when I, bought that whole cow I did, when it showed up. I, I don't have an amazing spatial sense, that's for sure. And I had no concept of how much meat was on a cow. And um, I lived in an apartment in downtown Oakland, California, and I packed my freezer full and I still had like two freezers full of meat. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like my apartment refrigerator. And so wow. I baked so many meatloafs. I gave them to all my friends. I, um, I mean, I basically shredded through this meat, gave it away. It was really inexpensive too. You know, it's like you buy direct, especially in that time. It was, it was a grass fed and finished animal, but it was, it was really affordable. So I was like being super generous with it, but I just, it was, and I ended up setting up a buying club with a group of friends that then became like a formal CSA. But the whole point was just, um, learning that it was really hard to do. And I did it. And then as my business picked up and my career picked up, I just didn't have the bandwidth to do it anymore. You know, I just, it was too much. I think I bought a quarter steer at that point. Some CSAs had kind of popped up, but it was like the nut that you couldn't crack. Right. And although I dabbled in the culinary world, I mean, and I've done all those different roles and things, it was, you know, I'm really a serial entrepreneur, I'd say. And my passion for the meat piece and the business piece, it was like the kind of the mix of this is something that needs to be done that hasn't been done that nobody thinks can be done. And so I met my business partner in 2009 for the first time. And he, my, the guy who became a business partner at the time I was doing consulting because I, um, it was, I started a consulting company to figure out basically my next step after exiting my, my last venture. And I, I knew I wanted something much bigger. I was in tr like kind of just open to the possibility and I felt like good food was moving into the mainstream. And so when I started working with my business partner in 2009, it was initially as a consultant, and then we ended up co-founding the company in 2012. And really came up with, I came up with the idea for him as a consultant in 2010, pitched it at the end of that year and kind of got the, the soft green light in 2011, did the business planning process, and then we launched in 12. So that, you know, the, the possibility of it was just meeting somebody with the resources and the desire to fund something bigger because then the challenges in sustainable ag is that it costs more money 
right? And so you need a partner, you need financing that is patient and willing to, to, to pay the price to build something really radical and different. A lot of people ask me about how to make liver more tasteful and how to cook it or incorporate other organ meats on carnivore. Optimal Carnivore can help you do just that with their grass-fed organ complex. It was created by carnivores for carnivores, and they start by sourcing 100% grass-fed organ meats from New Zealand, gently freeze-drying the organs and encapsulating them into convenient bovine gelatin capsules. Just six of these capsules a day is the same as eating an ounce of raw organ meat. Um, I personally take these every single day, as does my wife. Um, even though we both eat liver and other organ meats, our ancestors would have eaten the whole animal and this unique blend has nine different organs including beef liver brain thymus kidney spleen etc and i think it's great to get a daily dose of these organs um, when you can so it covers all your bases whether you're at home or traveling what's also cool is they plant a tree for every product sold which helps the environment so visit www.optimalcarnivore.com slash carnivore cast and use the code carnivore 10 to receive 10 percent off your purchase Thanks, and back to the show. Talk a little bit more about um, how Belcampo has gone and become the largest regenerative farm in the U.S. How, how has it scaled like that? Um, you know, maybe what have been some of the key milestones in your mind, landmarks, um, big events, big years for you? And, and um, I guess it's a, a lot of folks in in the carnivore community are very familiar with like white oak pastures um, and um, butcher box and um some some of these other um direct to consumer brands um us wellness meats and and bel campo seems to have come up on the the at least the carnivore diet and keto diet scene more recently um yeah. what what is what has spurred that and, and and what do you attribute that to totally that's a great question and you know my business we started it as a restaurant and butcher shop company and the reason this is like so tactical, but the reason that I didn't focus on e-commerce earlier, well, first off is that like everything was on fire for years. You know, it's been hard to get all these restaurants up and running. We built a USDA certified slaughterhouse and we were doing, you know, building the business and building the brand in California direct to consumers. The beginning of, and I'd say that, you know, I started in 12, the end of 12 with my first restaurant and we opened our slaughterhouse. And then 13, 14, 15, we were really focused on building, just building the brand and building distribution. By, um, by the end of 16, we started to see some signs around like keto and not carnivore yet, but keto and paleo really popping up. And I started to pivot the brand more towards wellness and diet and lifestyle away from culinary. You know, we were out there winning burger awards. We got top burger in America from Time Out. We were top burger in LA with LA Magazine. Like we got all the awards and we were playing in the culinary, but I felt like we were kind of like a wolf in sheep's clothing, you know, where we were really about radical change. So in 17 and 18, we started to, you know, kind of dig into that wellness agenda more and more. And then with e -com, COVID really opened the door because in the early years of the brand, it didn't seem to me that there was a enough of a market. Um, and it wasn't just my seat of the pants. I mean, we actually did some analysis on it, but for a premium source verified meat of our quality, there didn't seem to be critical mass yet. And so the other challenge is that our slaughterhouse is um, up in Wairika. It's a difficult area to ship out of. It's very underserved with like FedEx, it's very low density. So it's a really expensive area. So it's kind of like, well, where do we invest? Do we put it in a distribution center in an area like San Jose where you can get good rates on, on shipping or do we continue to plug away and sell through our own stores and do on-demand delivery? So we opted to, to, you know, we opted to stick with our own stores and build a brand through that. But when COVID hit, you know, all this kind of pent up awareness of the brand hit us like a, like a freight truck. And in the meantime, Scott, I'd opened in Erwan, a grocery store in Southern California. We're crushing it. We were just crushing it growing. We've grown 400% in that one wow. store in one year. It's amazing. And they were like, we don't know what the heck you put in your burgers, but like people, are we're their number two brand in their whole company right now so it's like i started to you know I, I think it's also like kind of daring to dream bigger a little bit you know or it's like we've got these great burgers and we have this cool store and people in santa monica love us and then it was like no actually we've got this rad value proposition that really nobody else has uh i mean some people have elements of it but the whole soup to nuts element that we have 
we, we realized it was just really unique and that people were ready for it. And COVID, I think, opened the door where, gosh, like all of a sudden it seemed like people were going to making a shift in buying their meats online. Um, so I, I started, and then in, in, by the by and by, it's like, I'd been kind of being more open about like on kind of the wellness, you know, you never want to alienate in a role of like being a CEO of a you know, founder. You don't want to, there's so many things that I don't talk about in what I do. Like, you know, I'm really radical on a lot of things, right. But I don't want to appear to be judgmental of other people's choices. Right. So I'd been kind of buttoned up on that, but in my own social channel, and then eventually in Bell Campos, we started to talk more about like kind of how radical we are and people like it vibe for people. And we started to build on that. So it, it felt like a coming home to my roots kind of, you know, it felt like the, the time that I was able to say like, we are an animal wellness company, <laughs> you know, it's, it felt like I was finally starting to play offense instead of just playing defense, you know, because you think about it for me opening all these different stores and we had like before COVID we had 500 employees in all these stores. I mean, it was a, it was a huge thing to manage. And with COVID, we, you know, we shut down a bunch of locations, we reduced the service model. So all of a sudden we were running way leaner and way meaner. And all of a sudden two people are like hitting us up, like, Hey, we put short ribs on the website. Will you start to do this? Will you start to do that? And we're like, yeah, we've got suet. We have liver. We got kidneys. Let's go. That's so awesome. it, it was so, it's been like, I mean, COVID has been so challenging. I'm not going to, I mean, it's, it breaks my heart to lay off people. We've had, you know, everything that can happen um, has happened this year. I mean, I'm talking to you in California where it's like, it's like midnight right now, right? The light, right? The smoke, like this year has been insane, but COVID brought Belcampo so many blessings in that it kind of gave us the courage to step into this national arena with our e-commerce offering and say, Hey, you know, we're going to be a little bit more expensive. Although honestly, when we benchmark, we're not that much more expensive with all the other e-com guys. And we have a radically different, um, value proposition. We're killing everything in our own USDA plant. We're marketing the whole animal for you. And I'm now just now working actually in my kitchen right now. I've got like six different products that I'm doing a final test on that are like, we're doing seasoned meats, um, all sorts of holiday meats. Like we're, we're going to be working more on semi-prepared foods as well. Just making it easier to buy our quality of meat without needing to necessarily, you know, be making everything from scratch. Right. So we're doing like more kebab style stuff, just not, not, not obviously like heavily processed in any way, but trying to come up with some stuff like pre-cooked meatballs that make it a little easier to buy the best quality meat and do it kind of on the go. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. That's really interesting. And I'm glad you've been able to embrace the change and uh, make, make lemonade out of lemons for lack of a better analogy. Um, but one thing I find super interesting, I'd love to get your opinion on Anya, is a lot of these um, direct-to-consumer e-commerce meat brands seem to be facing not an issue with a lack of demand. And, and I, I do want to get a little bit more into the consumer piece and education. And you mentioned pricing, and I want to talk about like how to educate the consumers around labels and quality and value. But on the on the supply side, it seems a lot of um, brands are are facing issues, and and it may be to your point that they're not as vertically integrated. Um, but you know, companies like Butcher Box and um, I, a, a lot of these brands um, are are having a lot of trouble meeting the demand of consumers um, in COVID and, and even pre COVID. Um, so particularly with, with your standards around regenerative, grass-fed, grass-finished. How do you think about scaling and being able to meet the demands of consumers um, moving forward in an e-commerce-driven world? These are gonna be great problems to have. You know, we, we have, right now we have oversupply. Um, and what I'm part of this question of like the seasoned meats that I mentioned just now is because some of the oversupply is cuts that I can't merchandise. So I, keep in mind that we're a whole animal shop. So compared to some of my competitive set that's really focused on ground beef and steaks and bacon, we have the whole cow to deal with and the whole pig. So we have right yeah. now 70 products on our website. Um, and so, okay, over Labor Day weekend, I was out of stock on about 15 of those 70 products, which killed me. But so we do run out because there's only two tri-tips on every beef. Right. But I, I, um, I'm marketing the whole animal. 
So that's a big asset for me. The other piece is that I'm, so even just saying that they, that cause I, we have our own slaughterhouse and we're processing the whole animal that we may not always have every, I mean, and we also price pretty, we know our, our ribeyes are expensive compared to our suet and our liver, but we, all those are coming from the same cows, right? So we're able to optimize the whole animal and that's a different model than any other. I mean, I think that, um, uh, white Oak is, is doing whole animal. I don't know how much on econ, but, um, there, there's that, that's a pretty unique aspect of having our own slaughterhouse and doing the whole animal marketing. So the other piece, and then, so my, my dream is that I'm going to get optimal animal utilization from e-commerce in a different way than I've been able to in my, in my stores. So in my stores, I would, you know, I can, I can sell ribeyes all day long, but it was harder to sell the other pieces online because I've been able to, I've been playing a lot with pricing now, like we're selling through oxtails and shanks and suet, like nobody's business. And that's been amazing for me because I am finding my consumer that wants that stuff. I want that stuff. I eat more yeah. suet than I eat ribeyes. You know, I cook everything in suet. You scramble your eggs in suet, your day is bomb. Like suet is magic. And I, I realize, like if I can find those, you know, those 5,000 consumers across the U.S. that are on the suet plan and offer them a great price on that product, then they're going to throw some ground beef in there too, which is a little higher margin. For, you know, so we're trying to build around the consumer that wants that whole animal. And yeah. There are consumers like you and me. I mean, I, I, I'm not doing a, I don't do a pure carnivore diet. I kind of alternate in and out of that. But, um, but we're eating marrow bones in my house, you know, a couple times a month. Right. And I, and I'm doing it cause I, I, it's for my, my health and my kid's health. Right. It's not even a flavor thing. It's absolutely a belief about health. Right. So I'm looking for that consumer that's making a health choice to eat the whole animal. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful. And I'm hoping that the carnivore community can help support, um, production like yours in making good use of more parts of the animal. Um, my wife yeah, and I, do, yeah, like more content too. I get so many DMS and I don't even have my, my sweetbreads are the best thing ever. And I don't have them on the website yet. I will soon, but like, that's a magic food. Like that's a, that's a total yeah. carnivore and health with sweetbreads, you know, but the way that we cook them in the U S is breaded and gross and fried. And I have a different way of cooking it. It's like, I'm trying to find the way to get the education out there about how to cook these minimally. Cause I'm not going to be able to do a pre-cooked or seasoned sweet bread. Right. But yeah. these are, yeah. these are really powerful foods. And I want to connect with that community. That's looking for the, the broader breadth of, of availability. I hope you're enjoying this episode with Anya Fernald, the CEO of Bel Campo meats. Anya was kind enough to share a discount code for carnivore cast listeners. If you'd like to try Bel Campo and some of their delicious grass-fed, grass-finished, pasture-raised meats, including organs, offcuts, as well as delicious steaks like ribeye and New York strip, go to belcampo.com and use the code CARNIVOREcast10, all one word, uppercase, to save 10% off your order. Now, back to the episode with Anya. One question around that is, um, you know, is there anything... So, so I think the carnivore community is probably one of the best places that and, and some of these restaurants that um, like take pride in, you know, I'm sure you know the chefs that take pride in having like a nose to tail menu and having that weird appetizer that's like some weird off cut. Um, yeah. I think carnivores especially really like to try to get, you know, things like the spleen and the thymus and all these weird parts. Um, but a lot of it, a lot of it is, it seems like being prevent, like the reason that consumers don't have access to that is twofold. One, in some cases, just it's the standard operating model of the grocery store, of the production facility, different parts of the supply chain to not even bother to try to sell different parts of the animal. And two, it's illegal in the US to, to, to sell certain things like cow brains is any of that changing or is there anything consumers can do or companies like Bel Campo can do to actually shift which parts of the animal are even available? Yeah, I mean, it, we're talking about it with spleens and thymus and stuff, but there's an analogous discussion around steaks like Bavette, Denver steak. I mean, some of the best eating on the beef is flat meat and it's just not conventionally available because it goes into ground beef 
it goes effectively into a waste stream because it's too it's it's too scarce to have aggregate volumes that make it a meaningful, you know, good component of a butcher case. That's what's amazing. So you know, cows are bilateral, and so the only steaks that you have in great abundance are the bilateral, like those two long loins that we cut into the ribeyes in New York and strip, right? Sirloin cap, all those different, that long, that long kind of like loaf of bread around the spinal cord of the beef is turns into most of the steaks. But then there's all these flap meats, which go, that ho basically hold the gut of the animal and they're stabilize the gut of the animal. And those are bavet, picanha, tri-tip, Denver, um, strip, flat iron. Those all are incredibly good eating. They're also high in collagen. Um, super nutritious, and they mostly get turned into into waste, into ground beef, because it isn't, they can't get marketed. The tri-tip is the one exception there. So you bring up a good point, which is like the market's dictating things in a way that, you know, doesn't favor people who are looking for unique things to eat or unique components of their health. I always like my kind of, don't tell the team in the slaughterhouse this, but I always kind of try to ask for one thing like every quarter you know so i got sweet breads done because for us to do that it's a huge amount of work and it's the kind of stuff that gets us into really tricky waters with the usda we run a usda plant so i have a two usda inspectors who are there almost constantly and so for me to get things like pig's feet ticks you know six months HACCP protocols meetings reviews and it's like the more static that you create, the more that they're on alert for other stuff as well. So I've, you know, now like my wins of the past year have been getting chicken livers, chicken hearts, pig's feet, um, suet, uh, and um, the sweetbreads. Okay, so five products that I've gotten through USDA. But, you know, Scott, two years ago, three years ago, I had got a new inspector in. This guy decided that, he didn't want us to do chicken livers and chicken hearts and they were just all condemned and there was no discussion. Wow. That's no crazy. Discussion. And that's big money for me. It's, I mean, it's like a huge issue. It's also like chicken livers are me and my daughter's favorite food. My daughter is like on the marrow bone and chicken liver plan. She's basically eats like 50% animal fat. Oh my gosh. She must be um, so healthy. <laughs> she's a beast. She's a beast. My kids are like, you know, they, they never get sick. They're, they're, it's like they're they're really testaments to pretty high animal protein animal fat diet, but they you know it was just it was such a heartbreaker for me that that we just all of a sudden six months this guy says nope, and that's the law. So I'd say it is difficult. It is difficult for us to get um, these products out into the market. It's very very difficult, and the reason why is that there's just not enough aggregate demand. So our plant, our slaughterhouse, is particularly well suited because we have our own operation and we're able to push these HACCP plans through. But the big in the bigger machine, the issue is that if I'm a small operator, like I am now, on a big day at Belcampo, I mean, we slaughter 50 beef in a day. That's a big day for us. And we, we are multi-species, so we only slaughter beef one or two days a week. So let's say on a day that we're doing 50 beef and we can then take the livers and take the, you know, the sweetbreads and all that. If I'm going to a big plant and I'm getting my beef processed there, 50 is a big day for me, but it's not a big day for them. They'll be doing 600 to 2000 in a day. Okay. So my 50 stacking onto the end of their big day is nothing, right? It's nothing. They're not, they don't give a damn about what organs I want to keep and whether yeah. or not they're going to get a HACCP plan approved with their inspector for some rinky dink rancher that does 50 in a week. Come on. Right. So that's the problem. It's like for the, the when you have to plug into the bigger infrastructure, it's very difficult to hold on to those other products. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, and it's kind of a chicken and egg problem um, because there, there's so much, there's such a wide gap between people uh, actually eating and wanting those foods um, at, at massive scale. So I think we're far away from that, unfortunately. But one thing I wanted to ask about, just because you come from the restaurant world, and, and you've seen it now from the production side as well, I think you'll have a really good perspective, is around suet. Um, so first I wanted to mention, my, you know, my wife and I get a ton of our meat from this local meat CSA. I talk about them on the podcast all the time called Walden Local Meats. They're fantastic. They source from- Oh yeah, I think I follow um, them on Instagram. Yeah. Oh, they're so good. And they yeah. have a butcher shop in Boston. That's won a yeah. bunch of awards. And they, all, they also source from all over New England, local farmers. You've 
have the name of the farm on the piece of meat you get. You get all the offcuts like bavette, et cetera. Um, and you can add things like chicken livers and marrow bones and whatever you like. Um, so, so we've had a great experience with them. But one thing we bought, buy a lot from them is beef suet. And we cook with the beef suet. It's super cheap, super versatile. You can make a million different things with it. And, uh, you know, every time we go out to eat or, or we're, you know, at a restaurant and we say, oh, we're allergic to vegetable oils. Can you use something else? They're like, what are vegetable oils even? And then we, they find out, oh, everything we make is in that. But it didn't always, it wasn't always that way, right? Like mm -hmm, restaurants yeah. used to use a lot more suet. And I know a lot of it is the political factor, obviously. And Nina Teicholz has written a fantastic book, Big Fat Surprise, about the shift from from um, from you know animal based fats to vegetable oils, but from your perspective, why aren't more chefs, more restaurants using suet to cook with? Like it's so easily, it's readily available. The butcher shops are practically throwing it away a lot of the time, right? Why isn't it more prevalent in the restaurant cooking scene? It's a great question. Um, I'd say the first issue, and I will also call out for people who are, I read so much about people loving on ghee. Hey, I think ghee's fantastic, but it's $30 for a quart of yeah. good ghee. And suet, it's the same thing. It's beef fat, just from a different part of the beef, right? And you can, you can get a quart of ghee for 30, you can get a quart of suet for six bucks, right? Four bucks. Um, super high in omega-3. So I, I'm always kind of amazed that just from a value perspective, like I'm all for spending a lot on food, but we, the, the, this, the cost of suet's fantastic. You know, it's a, it's a great value as you bring up. So uh, when I started Belcampo, we fried, fried all of our French fries in pure suet. Um, I now, I, I phased that out for a few years during the dark years when we were really struggling and and also kind of dealing with a, trying to become more of a gourmet brand, less of a wellness brand. And I was so stoked that I brought back the pure animal fat frying in, um, in February of this year of 2020. And now we use a blend of duck and, and tallow in that. And the reason why is that, as you know, from deep frying in suet, um, it's got that stearic acid, that sort of heavy viscosity, right. and that breaks most fryers. Um, so one issue is that the modern day equipment is just not built for it. Um, it's a, it's a, it's got that heavy, that the heavy unctuousness to it. So I, I don't know enough about the tech technology, but I need to learn more on this, but I believe it's a stearic acid that creates almost like this viscosity, right? It seems thick when it's, when it's hot. So it's, it's more dangerous and difficult to manage. The other big issue is, um, the vegetarianism and, and cost. I mean, so when I, um, switch to animal fat fries. I mean, my, my cost on the French fry went up five fold. Um, and we charge more for it, but I can't charge wow. five. Okay. So I have to charge, I can charge like 30% more, but I'm, I'm eating margin. I'm eating margin. Right. So it, it's really expensive compared. I mean, natural fats are always more expensive than hyper-processed soy and other oils. The other thing you should know, Scott, is just like, so I cleared out again at sort of the end of last year as I was really stepping into like, wow, Bill Camp was going to be this place where you can just feel amazing about everything you eat in our restaurants. I just really was on fire about that. And so I thought I'd done everything I could, but I'm like, let's just like scrape through. I want to do audit of every single ingredient in our kitchens and make sure there's no, I can commit, there's no canola, there's no soy, and there's no GMOs. And we had gotten rid of the, you know, we, we switched to avocado oil for fine. We did all these different things, but we still found canola in stuff, like in some pre-made things, in any pre-made marinade, there's canola and soy. So you'd be surprised. My cost basis went up significantly with the, even the minor cleaning out, the things that I was like, well, here we are at kind of the tail end. There's going to be barely anything left. The, the restaurants are, the cost load is, is high and those ingredients cost more. It's really about the money. And what we've seen in COVID is how fragile the economy for restaurants is, right? How fragile the P&L is for the restaurants, right? Um, it's, it's difficult to make money in the restaurant yeah. business. It's a game of cents. It's a game of pennies. It really is, you know, and, and they're squeezed. So I have huge empathy for my colleagues in the restaurant business. I've been able to clear out those ingredients because 
basically our restaurants are marketing for our meat company. So we're interested yeah. in them being profitable, but it's not like that's what the brand lives and dies on. And we are operating in places like Oakland, California, Santa Monica, Hollywood. Um, there are places in San Mateo, California, like where there's a pretty affluent, pretty hip to wellness community that's like willing to spend $22 on a hamburger. That's an, it's an eight ounce patty. It's on a four yeah. ounce patty. The twenty-two dollar hamburger—that's an expensive burger, you know. And we make money on that burger, but not as not as much on a percentage basis as as any other restaurant, right? Sure. So we, you know, it's a hell expensive burger. We still don't make as much on a percentage basis. I know this because I know my cogs compared to industry standards are still fifty percent higher than industry standards. Wow. Right? So that's the problem. It's just about the cost. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. At the end of the day, the economics of canola oil are just too good to pass up. And, and I, I totally empathize with the restaurant owners as well. I worked, um, my, my last job was for a company called Toast, which is a restaurant point of sale um, system. Oh, and uh, yeah, I've yeah, got to know the restaurant community very, very well. Um, and a lot of the challenge is of restaurant tours. Um, it's, it's definitely a, a tough game. Um, and so thinking a little bit more about the consumer perspective, how do you how do you educate consumers around labels and quality and value versus the price of your meats? Um, and do you think that consumer aptitude and knowledge is increasing around quality foods in the fight versus like marketing of food labels, like organic and some of these things? So I, I got turned upside down a couple of weeks ago because I did a consumer study and I thought that regenerative agriculture was the thing right now and it's still hands down organic. So I, I was surprised because I, I hear a lot of uh, organic getting a lot of flack in the kind of leading edge thinkers, people like you, um, people saying, you know, organic doesn't mean anything or it's bought and sold. But in my consumer studies of super progressive um, consumers, it's definitely still leading far and far ahead of regenerative agriculture, which is a more kind of holistic thing. So I, I, um, I kind of got that handed to me, which is good. It's good for me to orient around. I'm surprised because I think Organic is part of the picture, but pastured and regenerative are far more important when it comes to animal wellness and human wellness. Um, slow growing um, is another really important one. So I consider this, it's like, this is a marathon, not a sprint. You know, I'm working very slowly on the education side of things. And I try to, in, in our messaging around the brand, really focus on the human wellness things that I have documented. They're different. You know, our omega-3 ratios are very, very different. And I can talk about the why of that. Um, the, 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 the way that our chickens put on weight, you know, our chickens take 10 weeks to fully come to weight. A conventional chicken, even an organic one is two to three weeks. So looking at that for consumers and telling that story and saying, wow, why does ours take four to five times as long as theirs, right? what's different when they're being both being fed basically a grain based food. And so talk about that. And, you know, I think most consumers would say, wow, if I'm looking to maintain weight, do I want to be eating protein from an animal that's growing at like four times the normal weight gain? Right. So these are some things that are, that I try to pull out in my story, but I'm understanding that, that meets like this black box, you know, people just don't know very much and they honestly don't want to know too much because it's, it's a tough decision. You know, animals live and die to make your meat. And I think folks have kind of like gotten, learned how to sort of tune it out because it's a difficult decision. And the more, you know, the more kind of squeamish you are about it. So my goal is like, not necessarily to bowl them over with information. And I often think, you know, when you go to the farmer's market and there's that farm that's got, you know, meat in a cooler and then they've got like a really densely printed out one pager with lots of really amazing valid information about climate change and regenerative agriculture and husbandry and animal wellness right you know what i'm talking about like that guy that's got that all that information yeah and then I see people just blazing past that guy you know and and i've been that guy right i've been the guy who's like but let me tell you about carbon sequestration and perennial pastures and and so i've had to learn myself like dial back focus on pleasure, the stuff tastes better. Focus on compassion, it's better for animals. Of course, we're organic certified, of course. Like that's the baseline, yeah. you know? So I've kind of like, I've learned to just like shut up, keep it simple. And if my goal is like, maybe that I'm gonna get my consumer to, to spend 
instead of spending one minute a day thinking about meat uh, and where it comes from, spending two minutes a day, you know, like let's set a reasonable goal. Yeah. Yeah. Start small. I I really like that. And Anya, one thing you mentioned, I was listening to your interview with uh, Anthony Gustin on on his podcast, which was fantastic. Folks should check that out as well. Um, And you were talking about um, how your experience around selling through grocery stores and seeing the margins that products take has shifted how you think about buying products in a grocery store versus online. Can you explain that for folks? Because I thought that was just such, such a fantastic example and breakdown of how economics meet consumer demand meets quality of products, et cetera. Yeah, it's so interesting. And it's like, it's such a dumb moment for me. But when I started selling in grocery stores, I had a very special relationship with this grocery down in SoCal. It's still a fantastic partner. And we would just ship each of their stores a pallet of our meat every week right and then they'd sell it and it was like great and we'd pay for the shipping and then they'd pay us for the meat and um i thought this is great let's 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 open in like millions of grocery stores so we you know people knock on the door we started to get some more relationships and then we immediately they're like great here you need to now apply to work with this distributor well long story short i when i went through all the paperwork and figured out what it meant for us effectively we were you know typically i sell to a grocery store I charge them $10. They charge $14. They put a 40% markup on it. Fine. But when you go through a conventional distribution system, there's actually two other people that have to take a piece of it. There is a distributor and a broker. And between the two of them, it's like another 50%. So all of a sudden, either my $10 product needs to be charged. I can charge, like I have to be able to charge $25 for it, or I need to cut the costs down to like $4 to charge 14 that's the math. And, and so, you know, that thing that everybody says like, Oh, that brand used to be so bomb. And then they got bought and this happened and now they they're awful. Right. It it doesn't taste like it used to. We've heard that narrative, right. A million times of, I used to love that product and then they got so big and so greedy. Here's a newsflash. They didn't get greedy. Most likely they were losing money on a small scale and doing it right. And then they were acquired and somebody scaled them up and had to make money off of it. And to do that, you have to cut the margin. So you can, if it's like, let's say it's a, whatever, it's a, it's a package of ground beef. I can't charge more than like, maybe at the very, very stretch would be $14.99, right? I'm typically my meats at like $12.99 for a pound of ground beef. And then sometimes as low as $9.99. So let's say it's between nine and 12. Well, my costs on that are about six bucks, right? So, and that's like four and a half for the meat and a buck and a half for the grinding. And then I have to ship it somewhere. So if I go in and try to compete with my, you know, the competitive set, I basically have to do direct distribution. If I get distributors and brokers involved, I will categorically lose money. Let's say I do that. Okay. And let's say I'm just like, no, Belcampo for the win. Let's do this. Let's go to X enormous grocery store and open in 2000 stores. Okay. And we're going to price our beef at $9.99 $9.99 top of market, but in, in line with our competitors, I'm going to lose two bucks on every single package of beef that I sell. And then if I get acquired or if my board says, Hey, we're going to stop writing these checks, these $2 checks that we have to write every single time somebody buys a package of our beef, then what's going to happen. I'm going to have to find a way to gut the quality to make it make money with the various people that have their fingers in the pie. So it was a really harsh awakening for me. So if I make money, if I can do direct distribution to grocery stores. Now in California, we're a reasonable brand. Like people pretty much know that we are in a very small segment, right? Nationally, we're not. Um, I don't have any pull, right? So I have to go through a big distributor. If I go through a big distributor, I have to pay them 40%. So what I've learned is that to go into bigger distribution, to play that game with grocery stores, that's not like a one-on-one special relationship like I have with my two grocery partners right now. I, I have to either gut my quality or lose money. And that's changed my thinking about everything I see in the grocery store. And it's also given me a ton more empathy for so many small brands. I mean, you see this actually even in, if you look at like Beyond Meats IPO, statements, you know, you read their own, their own financial statements. They, they, they lose millions upon millions of dollars in a negative gross margin on all their products and distribution. Right. And, and the idea is that at some point either scale will fix that or they'll, they'll get big enough or somebody will buy them. That's bigger than them that will build in scale. Well, what the scale really means, it means buying in cheaper stuff in bigger and bigger volumes. Right. So the, the plan is always to gut 
the quality to achieve the margin. But I think that the grocery store model with distribution and brokerage built in, it's really just, it's, it's, you're disincentivized for putting good stuff in, in, the, in the bag. And it's not like that's saying you're condemning grocery stores, but I do think it's an opportunity for grocery stores that are looking to differentiate to play the game a little different and find ways to do direct brokerage relationships with smaller providers. Yeah, yeah, it's an excellent point, an interesting perspective that I think the consumer doesn't get um, when they're just going into the grocery store and looking for, oh, nice, they have they have this grass-fed, grass-finished product, or they have this, um, but why is it so expensive? Yeah, I mean, the other thing too is like in grocery stores, I can't charge more for what I than what I charge online. Yeah, like that's part of the deal. So I say, I mean, of course, I'm going to do direct to consumer and e-commerce. Because I can charge twelve dollars for that, and I can be profitable with that with that price point. If I'm going into a grocery store with a distributor in it, and I charge the same price, I will categorically lose money on it. So it, it's like there's the the thing is this this model right the the distribution model is built for products with a huge gross margin. When you get in, which is like the protein powders of the world and the highly processed canola oil, you know, like they work great for those products, right? They're hyper efficient especially for shelf stable stuff, the, it, the model works really well. When you move to products that have this higher cost of ingredients, that model is going to have to evolve. And that's just, it's an opportunity for evolution right now. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Anya, this has been fantastic. Really appreciate you taking the time. And I think folks will hopefully learn a lot and start to question a lot of their assumptions around um, their meat buying habits and hopefully um, try, try to learn more and just use this as a jumping off point. Um, where can they find out more about Bell Campbell? I'll, of course, provide all the links in the show notes and, and on the website. Um, and, and how can they use Bell Campo to start to educate themselves more generally um, about, about their meat and where it comes from and, and buying, buying good meat? So bellcampo.com is the place to start. Um, that's our e-commerce site. And then our Instagram handle is at Belcampo Meat Co. And that will give you lots of content around recipes, et cetera. Um, my personal handle is at Anya Fernald on Instagram. And I do a very regular rhythm of just meat centered recipes. Um, I'm also continually adding um, to my IGTV and eventually YouTube with things like how to render suet, um, how to make pemmican. I'm a big fan of pemmican. I make it all the time. It's my favorite snack. So I'm going to, I like to share those kind of recipes too. I'd say my personal content tends to be more on the carnivore side of like how to how to make meat, really good quality meat, as fabulous tasting as possible. That's great. Um, well, thanks again for your time today, Anya. Really, really appreciate it. I think folks will get a ton out of this. Oh my um, God. Thank you, Scott. This is fabulous. And I'm going to listen yeah. to some uh, more of your podcast too. I've just- Oh, thank you. So dope. It's, 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 a, it's, a, great, it's a great concept and a, and a really needed voice. Absolutely. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting the Carnivore Cast on Patreon. By becoming a patron, you'll help us reach more people and continue to create content on Carnivore. There are also exclusive perks available, such as private Q&As, consultations with me, and more. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash carnivorecast. Check the episode description for the link. Thank you, and I'll see you there. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Carnivore Cast. If you enjoyed this episode, please review on iTunes. It really helps us out. And share it with a friend. What questions would you like answered, or who would you like to hear from in the carnivore research community? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at CarnivoreCast, or go to CarnivoreCast.com. You can also email me at info at CarnivoreCast.com. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, keep it carnivore.